Come here. I need your help really quick. And then right here, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna do a, just do a clap. Okay. One more time. Boom. Perfect. Thank you so much. What was that for? I'll show you later. Okay. Right? Love you. Love you. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed drugs on this planet, with dealers at almost every street corner. And it's a drug that I get doped up on on a daily basis, about three to five cups worth. Well, technically speaking, coffee itself isn't a drug, but it's America's main source of caffeine, which is a drug. Some claim this black beverage of magic to be the source of all life and a potent superfood that will help us live to 500 years old, but there's also a strong community of people who believe coffee is the devil, that drinking it will stress your central nervous system, that it will spike cortisol till it's bursting through the top of your head, and that it'll give you adrenal fatigue, which isn't an actual medical condition, by the way. So if you ask around to find the truth, to find an actual answer, on whether or not drinking coffee is a healthy habit, you'll quickly find yourself surrounded by controversy, confusion, and straight up misinformation. So in this video, we're going to filter through all the bullshit to see what the modern scientific literature has to say about coffee consumption and our health. Mm. Yeah, baby. I like that. I like that a lot. So where did the myths about coffee consumption being bad for us actually come from? Uh, the still common but untrue myths about coffee causing every disease under the sun actually stemmed from faulty science back in the 1950s. See, in that time frame, uh, there was a lot of people smoking, a lot of people drinking, and a lot of people were quite sedentary living inactive lifestyles. And this is back when doctors were recommending certain brands of cigarettes over other brands, and they would even you know, smoke in their office. So back then when they looked at the data that they had at the time, they failed to separate coffee consumption from other unhealthy lifestyle habits and behaviors. Uh, those such as drinking, the smoking, the lack of exercise, the nutrition, all of that. So when the data showed that people were unhealthy and or those with diseases, they simply just pinpointed it to the fact that they all just so happened to also drink coffee. They didn't look at the smoking, they didn't look at the unhealthy lifestyle, they didn't look at any other factors involved and that's what we call a shitty interpretation of science and that's why in this video we're looking at the modern scientific literature that does control for things like that things like that gives us more accurate data so we can make more accurate assumptions that we can implement into our life so i don't want to go too deep into what they claimed coffee was bad for back then and the, back in the day but you can literally just think of it as they thought coffee caused every single disease uh, so roughly 70 years later though and the verdict is in we have an agreed upon standing on the risks and benefits of coffee consumption, of regular coffee consumption. And the verdict is, is that it's probably not bad for you. Matter of fact, it can actually come with some potential health benefits. If one thing is clear among all the scientific literature, it's that moderate coffee consumption, somewhere in the dose of three to five cups per day, is clearly related to a longer lifespan, uh, it's generally safe for most people and can boost mental and physical performance and is more likely to benefit health than to harm it. What a flip on its head. We went from thinking that coffee is, or believing that coffee is the source of all disease under the sun to saying that, oh, well, it's actually probably healthy for you. At worst, it's neutral, right? So I'm grateful for the beauty of science. I'm grateful for the people that actually take the time to do these this type of research and to interpret this type of good data. Now, remember, this is what the medical journals say. That's what we know to be true based off of data that we currently have that can apply to the general public, that can apply to everyone. So when science says these things and says these statements for the general public, they're taking into account all the potential risk factors, genetic factors, lifestyle factors, the quality of coffee used in the experiments, etc., etc. So if science has that in mind, and can still say that it's probably healthy for you and that it's okay to drink it, that's really, really promising. So that's what the science has to say about coffee. Now I'm just gonna share with you my personal experience and thoughts on coffee is that honestly, it fucking rocks. It helps me win at life. It is a performance enhancing drug. And personally, my own opinion, my thoughts is that 
coffee is probably healthier than we currently believe it to be based off the data that we have. Remember, conducting research takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of resources to do experiments, to control for certain things, to just the money period, it takes a lot of money to, to, to do these experiments and to, to conduct this research. I can't even imagine what it's like. I have complete respect for the scientists that do these things. But my point is, is that it takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of time. What I'm saying is that there's probably, in my opinion, a lot of incredibly beneficial compounds found present in coffee that are doing amazing things in our bodies and to our brain that we don't even know about yet, that we haven't even discovered beyond what we already know. So what do we already know though? Uh, there's a few things. There are some beneficial compounds that we do know to be present in coffee that can have some potential health benefits that have been shown so in studies, in animal studies, human studies, and in vitro studies uh, in both caffeinated and decaffeinated coffee. So there are some potential, you know, uh, uh, negative effects of coffee as well. And I'm going to cover that very clear here. It's not that it's just this magical beverage. There are some things to look out for, but I'll get to that in a minute. But what do we already know? What compounds do we already know are present in coffee? There's things such as chlorogenic acids. There's diterpenes, which I talked about triterpenes in my uh, reishi spore oil video. Uh, diterpenes, tri triterpenes are these uh, fatty acids that have been shown to have some different uh, positive potential, positive health uh, effects on the body. Uh, the diterpenes in coffee are cafestal and kawaiol, among a few others. There's melanoidins and polysaccharides. Caffeine is one that's present in coffee that we're all pretty familiar with. There's trigonaline and beta carbolines. And collectively, all these things, I don't even know what a few of those are necessarily. I just looked at in research that these have been identified in coffee and that collectively as a whole can offer neuroprotective anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, and antioxidant effects to humans, to animals, and, and in vitro studies. Matter of fact, coffee is actually the number one source of antioxidants and polyphenols in the modern diet. It's higher than blueberries, it's higher than chocolate, it's an amazing power-packed source of antioxidants and polyphenols and these phenolic compounds that have um, some promising looking uh, health benefits on the human body. Well, to start with some of the benefits, let's start with this massive study of 400,000 people. This was a prospective US cohort study by Friedman and Paul. And this study involved more than 400,000 people, like I said, and is so far the largest human study investigating coffee and health. What was found in the study was a significant inverse association between coffee and specific deaths due to things like heart disease, respiratory disease, stroke, injuries and accidents, and diabetes, and infections. Total mortality was reduced considerably by up to 16% for both men and women who drank four to five cups of coffee per day. Similar associations were observed in a uh, study from Fulmer et al. in 2017 uh, on whether participants drank predominantly caffeinated or decaffeinated coffee, and they found uh, uh, similar benefits from both. So we know based off the data that we have that coffee, regular coffee consumption, moderate coffee consumption, three to five cups per day is related to a longer lifespan and to reduce all cause mortality. So right then and there, all these different meta analysis showing such a thing is very powerful. But now let's get into some of the finer details um, on what actual effects we can feel from coffee. So the benefits reach into primarily what most people feel when they have their first cup of coffee is the mental and physical performance benefits. Uh, showing that both caffeinated and decaffeinated coffee can enhance alertness, perception, memory, mood, reduce headaches and mental fatigue. And caffeine and coffee are also popular among athletes for its positive effects on endurance and exercise capacity. Personally, for me, if I don't have time to whip up a pre-workout cocktail, which I usually do here at home before I work out, I'll make sure to just simply have a strong cup of coffee if I'm short on time because that gets the job done and it gets the job done well. Now, aside from the short-term cognitive boosts that we feel in coffee, there's also a long-term uh, protective effect against neuroge neurodegenerative diseases with long-term coffee consumption as well. And it's so it's not just these short-term enhancements, but long-term brain health. So for this, I'm actually gonna read uh, a couple highlights from an e-chapter from a paper titled Achieving Sustainable Co Cultivation of Coffee. It's from Burleigh Dodds Science Publishing. And I'll leave a link for this in the description. This e-chapter is free to look at. And it does an incredible job at discussing the science behind coffee and its effects on humans, 
Um, and to be honest, I did get a good portion of my references and research from this paper. And I want to give credit where credit is due. So if you want to check this out, it's pretty in depth and it's pretty sciencey and it goes into a lot of detail. I'm just taking the main points here for you. Uh, but if you do want to read it, look into it. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. It's an awesome read. So uh, let's look at coffee and cognitive health on page 17 here. There are studies that show an inverse association between coffee consumption and the development of Alzheimer's disease with a 27% risk reduction. Uh, the mechanism behind this is believed to be related to the anti-inflammatory effect of caffeine on the A1 and A2 receptors, in addition to reducing the, the deposits of toxic beta amyloid plaque in the brain, which is a characteristic, a strong characteristic uh, of those that have Alzheimer's disease, uh, beta amyloid plaque or beta amyloid peptides, some people call it. Uh, the intake of polyphenols also seems to help decrease the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Remember that polyphenols, I'm sorry, that coffee is one of the richest source of polyphenols we have in the modern diet. Uh, a large number of epidemiological studies have reported an inverse relationship between the caffeine consumption and the risk of developing Parkinson's disease, which does have to do with brain health. And from the meta-analysis of 26 studies, a 25% lower risk of Parkinson's disease was found in coffee drinkers compared to non-coffee drinkers. And that is from Kuwana et al, 1999. And there's also a rodent model a rat study showing that trigonaline may exert a neuroprotective effect, inducing a significant reversal of motor dysfunction uh, in humans as well, which is powerful. Trigonaline is a compound found in coffee. Now, if we look at coffee and cardiovascular disease, which this is where, you know, back in the day, a lot of people thought that coffee would give you a heart attack that would have negative effects on your cardiovascular health. So current data, though, shows otherwise. So in vitro and animal studies indicate that coffee has high antioxidant and high uh, anti-inflammatory potential. It improves endothelial dysfunction and reduces insulin resistance, which are key mechanisms for cardiovascular protection. And a study done by Anderson et al. in 2006 studied the relationship of coffee drinking with total mortality and mortality from cardiovascular diseases. Uh, there were 41,000 postmenopausal women followed for 15 years. They evaluated the causes of mortality because there was over 4,000 deaths within the time of the study. And the authors observed that coffee consumption increasingly reduced the risk of cardiovascular and other inflammatory diseases in these postmenopausal women, thereby decreasing mortality from these diseases. This effect was attributed to the ability of coffee to inhibit inflammatory processes via its antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds. Furthermore, a meta-analysis was carried out by Kripa et al. in 2014 using 21 prospective studies with almost a million participants. And in that time frame of this study, there was over 120,000 deaths, reported deaths. Results indicated that coffee consumption is inversely associated with all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality, and that the risk was increasingly reduced for those who consumed three to four cups on a regular basis. Similar results were also observed in another study by Malerba et al. in 2013. There was also a meta-analysis done by Ding et al. in 2014, and they found a clear inverse association between the coffee consumption and the risk of developing diabetes. Compared with no or infrequent coffee consumption, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes was reduced linearly with a 33% reduction for six cups per day. In similar comparison, drinking up to four cups per day of decaffeinated coffee was associated with a 20% risk in developing diabetes. Powerful information is being withdrawn from these studies. Now, the main compounds responsible for protective for the protective effects of coffee seem to be from chlorogenic acids uh, and its derivatives, as well as trigonaline. Again, they appear to prefer preferentially target hepatic glucose metabolism by improving insulin sensitivity. Now, if we go even further, which we could, there's a section on coffee and liver disease, coffee and cancer, and a lot more information on the bioactive compounds found in coffee. So I definitely suggest uh, that you take a look at this paper. It's a really good read, and I want to give them complete credit for providing me some of the research for this video. Now, personally for me, another way to get a powerful benefit from drinking coffee is by enjoying a good cup with a good friend or in good company. There's definitely a social aspect and a relaxation aspect of drinking coffee around good company. I mean, what better way to spend your caffeine high other than getting productive work done than to spend it with you know a friend, having good, deep, healthy conversations.
So with all of that being said, does that mean that there are no negative effects to drinking coffee? Absolutely not. As with most things, context is very important. So I'll go over some of the known potential negative effects of drinking coffee as well. Then I'll drop in my personal perspective on how coffee can be an unhealthy part of life as well. So first off, there's caffeine, right? Now it's not that caffeine in and of itself is bad, just like with sugar in and of itself is not bad. Perhaps overconsumption of these things can then become a bad thing. It's, it's, it's that some people react differently to different things, right? Some metabolize caffeine slowly and others more rapidly. What that means is that it leaves their system faster than others. So if you're a slow caffeine metabolizer, like I am, I got that, uh, I found that out based off some genetic testing I did uh, earlier last year. I make sure to have my last bit of caffeine before 12 p.m. After 12 p.m., I don't drink any caffeine and I make sure to do that. I make sure to not even have a uh, raw cacao or some dark chocolate too late in the evening as well because that will stay in my system and I do notice a, 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 a negative effect in my sleep from that as well. And my sleep latency um, gets negatively impacted for that, which means it takes me longer to fall asleep and I've monitored that very closely. So after 12 p.m., I don't drink any caffeine. And I wanna make clear that it is the responsibility of each of you to pay attention to your response to caffeine. Pay attention to the response of your caffeine intake at different times of the day, right? And, and, and adapt your intake patterns accordingly to that. See how you feel. This is where self-experimentation and self-awareness comes into play. So, you know, if you are a slow caffeine metabolizer, or if you don't know, just experiment, um, try not having caffeine in the afternoon or past 12 p.m. or 2 p.m. Uh, if you're really sensitive to caffeine, then go for decaf. As we saw in some of the earlier studies, there are uh, health benefits to drinking decaffeinated coffee as well. Just make sure it's a chemical-free process. Uh, I prefer like a Swiss water decaf. There's also a, a sugar process where they let the coffee, you know, ferment in sugar basically, and it kind of absorbs all the caffeine. So, uh, but you're mo more likely to find like a Swiss water decaf, uh, which like I said, has been shown to have some of the health benefits of caffeinated coffee as well. So there's a workaround for that one. If you're sensitive to caffeine, you don't metabolize it fast, stays in your system for a long time, keeps you up, just have it in the morning, limit your intake, uh, or have decaf you know, later in the afternoon if you really like the taste. Now, there's another problem with coffee as well. Uh, the next issue would be with the acidity of coffee. And the acidity in coffee, because it's a very acidic drink, can cause an issue for those with stomach acid problems. It can cause you know, uh, heartburn, acid reflux for some if you have issues with that. And if that's you, there is a solution. Use paper filters when brewing your coffee, which filters out many of the oils, the fatty acids, and uh, uh, yeah, many of the oils, the fatty acids, and the acids as well. So typically, if you want the healthiest cup of coffee, it is best to, to not use paper filters. If you don't have stomach acid issues, I would suggest, like for me personally, I don't use paper coffee filters because I want the chlorogenic acids. I want the diterpenes in there. But if coffee causes an, an, an upset stomach for you, use a paper filter, it's okay, right? You're still gonna get great health benefits um, and it's gonna be easier on your stomach. So there's a workaround for that as well. Now, cold brew coffee also has lower acidity. This is actually cold brew coffee. I just heated it up in a pot. Um, so that would be perfect also because it's uh, coming up on summertime. So that'd be a, a very enjoyable as well. Now related to this would also be the possibility of some of these fatty acids or diterpenes in coffee raising LDL. That seems to potentially be an issue for some as well. So if you have LDL or major cholesterol problems, again, use filtered uh, filters, paper filters, when brewing your coffee to filter out some of these acids, some of these, uh, some of these fatty acids and diterpenes and things like that. So there's a workaround around that. But again, use your own judgment. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving you medical advice. Lastly, uh, it can be addictive for sure. Withdrawal symptoms, absolutely. Dependent on coffee, completely. I experienced that. Technically, I guess I'm a drug addict. I'm a coffee addict. Uh, if I don't have coffee, I will get a headache at the times that I usually have my coffee. Uh, so there's definitely a dependence and a withdrawal factor and a withdrawal phase as well. Uh, but here's the key word, is that it's a phase. It's a great idea to cycle one to two days off a week from coffee and caffeine. I do my best to do that and I typically do that on my low output days, on days where I'm just kind of chilling, relaxing, recovering, and I don't need the caffeine boost. So another method would be to take a whole week off every four to six weeks. But personally, I'd rather just cycle one to two days out. I'd, I'd just rather cycle off one or two days a week 
um, instead of taking a whole week off, but that's just me. So cycle off one to two days a week or take a week off every month or so. Those are some of the known negative effects in the literature, but now let me just share my opinion with you. I think that if you're waking up from a regular shitty night's sleep, like you regularly get really bad sleep, your stress is high, and you drag yourself to the coffee machine, as soon as you wake up, like as soon as you open your eyes, you know you need that cup of coffee to wake up and to function normally, then I would consider that an unhealthy relationship with coffee. When you have your health in check, when you have your health trifecta aligned, which I talked about in my priorities video, how to prioritize our health and what things are most important. When you have all the big factors in check, you're living a good life, your diet is good, your sleep is good, your stress is managed at a tolerable level, and you have a high healthy baseline, that's when coffee can be a great, amazing, regular addition to our regimen, to our life. Because at that point, you can really feel its powerful nootropic-like effects, its powerful physical performance-enhancing effects to boost your workouts, to boost your productivity. Does that make sense? When you have a healthy baseline and you add coffee in, it's just so much better than using coffee just to get by. So it's a tool. It's not a means to an end for you to function. Does that make sense? That's my personal take on it. If you need coffee to function and you have to have it, then it gets a little eh right? And if your stress is all high all the time, then, you know, maybe we need to reconsider some things. So if you want to see that video on how, I on how I prioritize my health and what I find to be most important for feeling fucking awesome all the time, I'll leave a card right here. Go check that out. It's a great video. So I'll repeat this again. It is the responsibility of each of you to pay attention to your response to coffee and caffeine intake at different times of day, at different doses, and adapt intake patterns accordingly, okay? Just because I drink three to five cups a day doesn't mean you have to. Science says that it's pretty good for us though. Uh, but again, use your judgment. And if you don't like coffee, then don't drink coffee. I'm not here to force you to drink coffee. So in conclusion, if we have a high healthy baseline, if we're living optimally, if we have generally low stress, if we have good nutrition that works for us, if we have a proper exercise routine, if we don't excessively drink or smoke and we just live an overall optimal healthy lifestyle, I think it's safe to say that coffee can be an amazing, an amazing performance enhancing superfood that we can include on a daily basis, liberally. So now that we know that coffee is a healthy beverage that we can include on a daily basis to help us feel amazing, what is the best way to buy coffee? What's the best source? What's the best way to brew a healthy cup of coffee? I'm gonna have a video on that coming out within the next month or so. If it's already out, I'll put a card right here. But until then, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you get notified when that video comes out. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button. If you didn't enjoy it, hit the thumbs down and give me some feedback in the comments. What would you have liked to see done better? I would like to know. Aside from that, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found value in this video. Make sure to interact with me in the comments down below. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions and to connect with you make sure to hit that subscribe button if you like me if you like my style so that you get notified when i post my weekly videos i will see you guys next week i hope you have an amazing an amazing week i love you thank you for watching